amazing. The atmosphere was fantastic. The band was so brilliant. She's just cool. She stands on stage drinking the wine. They had a male voice choir. They sang so many good songs. They sang old ones. They sang B-sides. It was amazing. Keris was fantastic. She looked so pretty. And by the summer, with the album having hit number one, they enjoyed the biggest moment of their career at the Glastonbury Festival. It was Glastonbury that made a massive impression on me, I think. Owen Powell again. Nighttime festival gigs, up until that point in our career, we'd never done them. We played festivals two o'clock in the afternoon to 30 people in a couple of burger stands. We weren't sure whether we were going to play in the end because it was another one of these rainy Glastonbury's. We were sat on the bus and somebody came on and said, oh, it didn't look like you're going to play because there's like water all over the stage, it's not safe. So we sort of opened a few cans of lag and started to relax and all of a sudden somebody arrived and went, you're on stage in two minutes. Like running across the mud on the stage. It was that exciting that, you know, you just think, well, where can you go after this, really? <laughs> Where indeed. What about the glitzy fashion parade that is the Versace party in July 98? All right, then. You think you're some bad girl. You just wait till someone else gets hold of you and beats the living daylights out of you. When we arrived at the airport and got whisked through customs, and we all had our passports out, and one of their bodyguard people said, oh, we are Versace, we do not do customs. seem to run Italy, or at least that part of Italy, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> at first we were told we were doing an hour set after this fashion show, and then we were told we were doing half an hour after the fashion show, and in the end we played about three songs. When it actually came to the gig, you know, you just wonder, what, you know, what the fuck are we doing here, you know? <laughs> Basically what happened was, I reckon, they were having some fashion show, they looked at the charts and they went, ah, oh, Catatonia, they've got an album at number one, we'll invite them over. And then when they actually saw the state on us, they thought, oh, fuck this. <laughs> I think that was one point where the absurdity of it was obvious. You know, you couldn't miss it, really. To our eternal shame, they limoed us down to the Versace store in the middle of Milan. They closed the shop for us as well. Mark Roberts again. I think I got a leather jacket. Which I can't wear because it just looks, you know, <laughs> it's just a naff. But it was about the only thing there that I thought, well, I might wear that or I can give it to my dad. I got a pair of shoes which once I got home and you know had to look at them in the cold light of day, I think I just gave them to um, Oxfam in the end. We've never been asked again. Riding on the back of their profile in the UK, the band headed abroad again. This time to the States. As soon as you have a bit of success, you're very much in demand, you know, and, and the States sort of beckoned. Well, it felt like it was looming more than anything. And we decided to go on this tour, played in these sort of bowl-type places. And um, we were playing on the second stage, which was in the car park, you know. So I think we all just wanted to come home, basically, and, you know, start the other album. Unbuckled my handcuffs from my fence at home and flew me to America. I think it's going to take a bit longer than a month to sort of crack the states, as they say. We sold at least uh, nine. Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> I think. I think it'll... it doesn't matter what you've sold, but what's what's your worst. Ooh, that's good, isn't it? That's good, that is. What we did was we started doing the demos when we were on the bus. We used to finish the gig, get on the bus, do bits and bobs with, like, mics hanging from cupboards and on the sofa next, you're trying to lie down to sing bits and bobs. And we did most of it out there. It was harder to bash it out in the back of a bus than it was in rehearsal, and I think that's kind of reflected in the record. Perhaps we were trying to do too much. Or perhaps, you know, in retrospect, we should have just said, oh, hang on, let's just do nothing for a month or something.
Risen for the most part on the road, the aptly titled Equally Cursed and Blessed became the follow-up to International Velvet. But more than that, being back in the studio seemed to provide a hiding place for a band who wanted to escape the madness of their own success. We went into the recording another album too quickly. Guitarist Owen again. We'd spent more or less a year and a half living away from home, not seeing friends and family. I think it was our decision to go and do the album that quickly. And I think we were on our own personally created treadmill by then. End of 1998. Paul. With the Manics gigs, we were playing arenas for the first time as a tour. Sometimes it was a little bit, um, just a bit intimidating in a way. Keris particularly felt as if, you know, she'd been sort of pinned and mounted, really, you know. Just sort of standing there in front of all these people expecting something, really. You know? I think that we felt it was going to be a celebration of what had been, you know, quite a long journey to that point, but it ended up being, I'm not quite sure that we can handle these kind of gigs. I'm not sure if we were ever cut out to do those kind of gigs. I think we've conspicuously tried to avoid those kind of shows ever since then, having maybe been slightly burned by that experience. Seems like we're quite in In the meantime, Keris had become a tabloid newspaper regular and a face on London's party circuit. I can get as drunk as I want and fall flat on my face and only my brother and my girlfriend know that I've done it, whereas if Keris does it, then people can read about it the next day over their breakfast. Mirror columnist Polly Graham. I think the reason that tabloids love Keris is because there's a lot of very squeaky clean stars out there and she's not afraid to say what she thinks. She likes a bit of a drink and sometimes, you know, she'll be slurring her words, slagging people off and just having a bit of a laugh. And that's good fun and you're always going to get stories out of that. Whereas a band like S Club 7, frankly, are just a bit yawny. If anyone was writing a story, they wouldn't write it about any other member of the band. I think there were periods when it seemed as if she was having a hard time, really, because, I mean, I can understand that there'd be an enormous pressure on her at times as well, you know. Drama, Alad Richards. At, at times you could feel that she didn't like it, but she had to do it, like, because it only comes around once, doesn't it? Once people first start to recognise you, it does take a while to get a little bit used to it. And then um, I didn't give myself that time to sort of get a bit used to it. I think it all started coming home. It was an old um, 24-hour party and it was an all just a laugh. You can only have a certain amount of that highness before you fall flat on your face and I think it was during that time that I kind of felt as if I was falling flat on my face. As Keris started coming to terms with her newfound celebrity status, the rest of the band began to fear for her creativity and state of mind. We weren't being invited to the parties anyway. Mark. Which was all right with us because we didn't really want to go to them, but we just worried that she was like overstretching herself, like, you know, and sort of, I don't think you get much ideas for material going to parties and stuff. I mean, they're a laugh in small amounts, but um, I think we were just being overprotective of her, and she resented that a little bit, I think. Meanwhile, the singer's comments in the press started landing her in trouble again. Interviewed by music magazine Melody Maker, she was asked what she'd do if she found out that a friend of hers was a heroin dealer. In classic Rye style, she replied, I'll get some stuff off them cheaply. There are worse things in the world than drug dealers. The remark, edited and seen coldly in print, provokes an immediate backlash. That was a part of the questionnaire for Melody Maker. It was a flip and dance, said in jest. The unfortunate thing, I think, is what she obviously couldn't have foreseen, nobody could, was that when this went to the press, a couple of days later, there was a massive publicity thing going on with a new anti-drugs project in South Wales. Within sort of two days of Melody Maker hitting the newsstands, 
you had just about every Welsh MP involved in this anti-drug thing. She was sort of crucified for that. I just meant it as a joke, you know? Back on the promotional bandwagon, the demands of being in a band started to take their toll. Having rushed into doing Equally Cursed and Blessed, you forget that after an album comes the tour and all TV and the rest of it. And I, I think going out and having to promote it is the more onerous task, really. And I think we did run out of steam. I think we all ran out of steam quite badly. Caught up in endless promotion, the band pushed themselves forwards to play their biggest gig to date in October 99, NetAid. Someone said that it was going to be like the Live Aid, but on the internet, which I don't know if it was. I don't think it took off. It seemed to be like a massive sort of event in the planning stage, but then it seemed to take a, a massive turn down somewhere along the line. That was quite nerve-wracking because it was like press conferences to do after. Keris was sort of panned a little bit for suggesting that no, well, it wouldn't make any difference, you know, the result of the thing. But I mean, I think the feeling was that it probably wouldn't make any difference, but it was just sort of a bit of an embarrassment to the people who were staging the publicity thing after the event, you know. We just like stood on a podium with Keris doing the talking and we just, we didn't want to be there, I don't think. <laughs> If you missed Catatonia at NetAid and were planning to see them this winter, you won't be able to. They've announced they're cancelling their five-day UK tour, which was due to start in Glasgow in December. The band say they need a break after nearly two years of work, and they can't put together a show they can be proud of. Enough was enough. Amid rumours of breakdowns and breakups, the band cancelled their awesome tour, citing exhaustion as the reason. Jeff Travis from the band's label, Blanco and Negro. I got a call from the manager saying that, you know, things are not good, Keris is not in a good way, and I think the most sensible thing would be just to stop, which I agreed with. Keris in particular had started to feel the pressure. Things she'd been bottling up, including her split with guitarist and former boyfriend Mark, began to get the better of her. I wasn't very well, I don't think, no. A lot of shit has hit the fan with a band, right? And there's a lot of shit that I dealt with quietly and functionally, you know? I kept on going and I hit it all. And then about a year or two after International Velvet, it all came out and poof. So I had to deal with an awful lot of history with a band and stuff. Like Mark and that, you know what I mean? I just dealt with that. I went straight on tour and I just didn't... didn't I just dealt with it. And it, I don't think that's particularly healthy, to be honest, looking back on it. Two years of bottling it up. No, try ten. <laughs> ten years of bottling it up. And constant touring. And a broken heart. <laughs> Looking back on it, I think it was a gradual thing, really, but it just seemed to grow into sort of a frenzy, and it just became more and more obvious, and you just think, oh, hang on, this isn't going to happen, you know, we're not going to be able to do this. And you just start thinking, well, we could roll on and do it, but by that time, we're either going to be killing each other, or somebody's going to walk out and just say, oh, fed up with this, I'm not doing this anymore, it's not worth it. So I think we did the best thing in the end. In a state of some disarray, the story goes that Catatonia, at least for a while, had ceased to be. But was this really the end of the road? Jeff Travis again. I thought over the last year and a half that they definitely might have split up. I didn't know whether they were going to come back from the hiatus that they took. I think that was definitely possible. I hadn't thought we'd split up as a band, definitely, you know. Paul Jones again. There wasn't this feeling that, oh, well, you know, she's left the band now or anything. It was more like, well, you know, give it a bit of space and, you know, see if she wants to do something after. And, you know, I don't think any of us wanted to put any pressure on her either because it's up to her what she wants to do. You know, there's no sort of moral thing that she has to do something with us, you know. It would have been much easier on a lot of us, I think, probably to say, oh, you know, let it all lie. How many people in a relationship or in a job, whatever you do, or in a family or in a band, whatever, if you're with each other all that time, you're bound to one of them. I wouldn't go as far as the, as the Nepalese um, prince and shoot everybody, but um, I must be frustrated to work with as well. In 
response to all the internal strife, the boys, back home in Wales, attempted to rediscover their faith in the band and started writing songs again. I think maybe some distance was a good thing, you know. I was sort of mucking around with ideas and then I, I was aware that Mark was doing the same thing as well. Owen had his ideas for songs and stuff and Alan was doodling around as well. So after a while of doing this, it was just sort of a couple of phone calls going around and saying, well, do you fancy coming around then? And, you know, it wasn't sort of a formal thing or let's do some demos or anything. Really, that was the beginning of this album. After almost a year, the band regrouped with Keris. She was away a lot more. She was keeping herself to herself a lot more. And then, you know, you'd sort of give it a ring and say, oh, we started doing some stuff, so do you fancy coming and have a listen? So she'd come down and have a listen. Owen and Alid. We did a Led Zeppelin, we're ashamed yeah. of me. We booked a cottage out in the middle of nowhere where mobile phones didn't work. It's basically the least populated part of Wales. We told the people we booked it off. We said we want a really remote cottage as a base for going walking in the countryside. And the guy came up the first night to show us where everything was. And then he came back the next day to see how we were getting along. And we had all our gear set up in the living room. And he ran in, like, and it was like, um, did a double take and went, ah, so this is what you do. <laughs> is that OK? He's going, shit, shit. You realise then that you've got no problem working with each other and doing anything that's creative. It's just sort of the bullshit that goes around it drags you down somehow, you know? As you can probably tell from hearing them talk, this is a band made up of really nice people. But having worked out some of their strengths and weaknesses, you still get the impression that, like most bands, the chemistry which keeps them together can also turn volatile. Feelings are still as strong because we do care about each other and do care about what we each other thinks. And then out of the blue, Mark and I will always flare. And the others are used to it, so they just don't take any notes at all. And then it'll go bang, 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 massive casting wheels, a couple of rockets, and a silver fountain, and then, uh, then disappear. On first listen, the new album, Paper, Scissors, Stone, does sound like a more autobiographical record. Not just about Keris, but about the band in general. Fuel, for instance, could be about the group running out of gas. Immediate Circle could be about quitting the London party circuit. Or are we reading too much into Mark's lyrics? And are any of the songs about Keris at all? Alid. There's been an ongoing thing, you see, where Mark will write a song and deny completely that it's about her. Mark. She's like so vain, she bets this song is about her. <laughs> He'll say anything. <laughs> Just to fill the time. Owen. Immediate Circle. The Queen of Clubs drinks in pubs on Thursday, swills down dregs, drags on ducks assed cigarettes. That could be about anybody, couldn't it? I mean... It could be. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> The album does contain at least one reference to a real person. The track Imaginary Friend refers to roadie Barry Corley, who died suddenly while the band were midway through the recording of their new album in Wales. We wrote that when we were doing Equally Cursed and Blessed, but it was sort of written towards the end of the session and we ran out of time, basically. There was this line about Barry C in it, you know, which was about Barry Corley, obviously. He'd been an old mate for years, you know, uh, he's from Thanos, the same place as me and Mark and stuff, and, um, and then he started coming on the road with us and doing guitars for Mark and stuff. I mean, one of the main lines towards the end of the song is a reference to Barry's firmly held belief that a Fender Telecaster was all he needed. Barry used to work on Mark's guitars. Mark would be there on stage with about five or six guitars, and Barry would just say to him, oh, you know, Mark, Fender Telecaster's all you need. The song was written, but before we actually got around to recording it and bringing it out, Barry had died. He, he was cycling and, you know, was hit by a car and stuff, and, uh, 
It's become more of a tribute since, I suppose. Had he been alive, I don't think I'd have left it in the song because he either wouldn't have liked it or he'd have taken the mick out of us. But as things happened, we left it in. I think the fact that the song was written before, but it was actually recorded after, I suppose it took on a significance for all of us that made it more raw. It sounds like a tribute to him, and I think it is a tribute to him. Paper Scissors Stone sounds like it's the most considered Catatonia release to date. It's also, for the most part, the band's own favourite. Part catharsis, part strife, part love, part clever wordplay, and as ever, partly made with a sense of humour that's been tumble-dried for several days. It sounds like the record that they wanted to make and hang the consequences. And whether you consider that brave or simply foolhardy, it is, at least, very them. I like this record the best, actually. Because I think International Velvet was probably more commercial songs, but this album has got some vibes on it that I don't think we've had before. Because there's a lot of shit have hit the fan kind of thing. And to get back together and, and still want to work together with everybody's strong feelings that they want to bring in. Do I sound like a prat now? To potential. It was important to us, put it that way. Very important. More, I think, than International Velvet. The question is, is the world still waiting for a new Catatonia album? It is going to be difficult, I think, because we've been away for so long that we're not quite sure what to expect, really, what people are into these days or whether they're even interested in another Catatonia album, you know. I think we all believe in what we're doing and there's no way we can change what we do, really. We're sort of stuck being Catatonia, so um, let's hope that a few other people are stuck listening to Catatonia, you know what I mean? Well, we'll see. Despite delaying the release of the album and rescheduling their UK tour, it's still going to be an important year for this band, and there are, judging by your emails and letters, still countless fans waiting for the record to emerge. Maybe it's just that these days, the relationship which we have with the band is similar to the one that they have between each other. Catatonia. Can't live with them, can't live without them. I absolutely love working with this band, there's something about it, especially, I've got to say it, Mark, sorry, but, you know, we go back a long way. I'm not leaving in a hurry, although it would be easier to go. But there's something about it that makes it special, so stay, you know what I mean? Everyone is a winner. 